Good morning. Good morning. Thank you to Mary Lightfoot. Uh, we, I got to hear her rehearsing that during the week, and uh, she worked so hard on that. And I got to tell you, thank you, Mary. You are just amazing. You're such a gift to us. We are very blessed. Welcome to everyone this morning. I'm Clayton Oliphant, pastor of the church, and we welcome both members and guests. If you're a first-time guest, a very special welcome to you. We're so pleased to have you here this morning. Hope and pray that you'll have a, a, a wonderful experience here at First United Methodist Church Richardson and that this service will be a blessing to you. We do have attendance registration pads on the end of each pew. Let me encourage you to pass those along at this time so that everyone has a chance to sign in this morning. We had a mission team leave uh, this morning to do a hurricane recovery work on the coast of Texas um, from the hurricane last year and that work continues and so we've we've got a team down there putting their faith in action in a, in a wonderful way please pray for them this week this week we continue with learning communities um, we have a number of learning communities that have already begun and then we have others that are just beginning this week including one by Robert Hunt who uh, grew up in this church and now is a professor at uh, Perkins School of Theology at SMU he's doing a class on Methodism in the world, United Methodist Church around the world, and a uh, very important and timely message. So again, great opportunities for you to grow and learn more about your faith. Next weekend is going to be a lot of fun. We have the Beatles concert on uh, Friday night. It's not actually the Beatles, but it's the Beatles music uh, next Friday night. And uh, we have um, the Cost of Poverty experience on Saturday. Lots of, lots of ways that you can uh, experience new things and grow in your faith and have some fun in the process. We have uh, so many opportunities on the back of the bulletin. We'd encourage you to uh, look at those. Again, we're glad you're here today. It's a great day to come together and worship the Lord. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Please stand as you are able as we sing. with me in our call to worship. Happy are those who walk in God's ways. Blessed are those who observe God's commandments. Faithful are those whose eyes are fixed on righteousness. Joyful are those whose hearts are filled with grace. Come, let us love the Lord our God.
probably one of my absolute favorites. Because of the challenge and the call to discipleship that it gives us. And so typically I say, take your bulletins home with you so that you can pray for the prayer concerns that are listed in there. And I will echo that today. But I also want you to take the bulletin home in case you're wondering, what should I be doing? Because this song hits so many areas of ministry and opportunities for discipleship that I think you might hear God calling your name somewhere in this song. And so there are also updates on our screens for things that have come in after the bulletin was printed. There are prayer concerns on each side. Uh, there are prayer blankets on each side of the sanctuary this morning. Uh, we invite you to come down and be a part of this praying ministry of the church. And at this time, I invite you to join your hearts with mine as we go to God in prayer. <coughs> Dear God, what a challenge the choir has sung for us. This challenge sets before us a tall order. That we, O oh God, are to be your light. We are to be your hands, your feet, your voice in the world. But, O oh God, our lights and our candles are already burning on both ends. We are burdened by the cares of everyday life. Sometimes we can barely fit in prayer, worship, let alone service. And so, your challenge still goes out to us, O oh God. Your calling is an idea that is sometimes too big for us to comprehend. But the more that we know you, the more that we learn of the life that you have envisioned to us, the more that we see that it is through us 
that your light shines in the world, the more the vision becomes clear. And so thank you for that challenge, to be light in the world, to be your hands, to be your feet, to be your voice. We take on that challenge, oh God. Because of our baptismal call, to so order our lives after the example of Christ, that through our lives, the world will be transformed. Why? Because our lives have been transformed. And as our lives are transformed, our homes are transformed. And as our lives and our homes are transformed, our community is transformed. And as our lives, our homes, and our communities are transformed, the world becomes transformed. And so, yes, God, you have work for us to do. Our faith tells us, bring it on. We pray this prayer in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, I invite our ushers to come forward to receive this morning's offering, and I extend to you an opportunity to give of your tithes and offering through the plates or online.
Amen. Children, will you please come to the steps and join me for children's time? Won't you come? I am so glad to see you all today. Um, now, you may notice there's some Bibles up here on the altar. Do you see that big stack of Bibles? So at 845, some of our third graders receive their Bibles, and some will come back at 11 and receive theirs, and some will be over in modern worship. And one of the things that Pastor Clayton told them earlier that he'll tell the next group, too, is to start reading, not at the beginning, but do you see how big this is? Yeah? We build their faith and their strength. It's awesome. So to start in the book of James, which is what we're all learning about right now. So the book of James, look at it. It's way back here. Look at this. Here's the book of James. Look how much of the Bible came before that. That's a lot, right? So James's letter is way back here in the back. And what James teaches us over and over again is how to live out our faith. And all of what we learn about how to live our faith is all in this part ahead of that. Isn't that amazing? One thing that sometimes you may hear if you go to Sunday school in large group is that we say this is the story of God and God's people and it's your story too. It's your story too. And when we come to church or when you open your Bible at home and you read about how, what you're learning, about how to live, you find some amazing things. Do any of you have Bibles at home already? Yeah, some of you may have Bibles or your parents may have Bibles that you can read. This is the same Bible that's what's in our pews here. It just has extra maps and drawings and thoughts and notes, all kinds of things to help us. But here's what I want you to know about this. You get to read the Bible. And there are some people in this world who may never get to read the Bible. But the way you live, the way you act, the way you treat people is teaching them about the faith that you've learned in the Bible. There's a saying, you may be the only Bible that someone ever reads. You may be the only Bible that someone ever reads. Everything that you do teaches them about what you know about God and about Jesus and how we treat others. So can I say a prayer for you before you go today? This week, if you have a Bible at home, I want you to pick it up and I want you to start reading James with us and, or get somebody to read it to you. And if you need a Bible at home, would you let me know? I'd be happy to make sure you get one. Are you ready? Let's say a prayer. How about if you repeat a little bit after me? Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for the story, the story of you and your people, and especially the story of Jesus. Help us live every day to show people about your love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, y'all go back to your seat. See you next week.
scripture reading from, comes from the book of James, chapter 2, four, verse 14 through 18. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but do not have works? Can faith save you? If brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply to the bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I by my works will show you my faith. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, Grace. Great job this morning. Thank you so much for reading for us. Our third graders have their Bibles that they, they received today, and um, I was telling them at the early service, they're not the only ones who got a new Bible. I got a new Bible. Um, this is my old Bible that's been rebound. It's a 100,000 mile checkup. And uh, so, um, and someone asked me if it was my third grade Bible that I got. And um, I got it 33 years ago. So some of you probably figure that's my third grade Bible. I'll let you keep thinking that. It's my, actually my ordination Bible. And um, so I was ordained and given this Bible and, and I've had it for 33 years. Still the same Bible on the inside, but it's way too pretty on the outside. I'm used to one that's all torn up and this is so pretty and nice. And it's ready for another 100,000 miles and I'm ready for another 33 years of, of using it. And um, so, um, I've ended up with a lot of Bibles and not just my Bibles, I have several Bibles that I've accumulated over the years, but, um, you know, in, in a family, sometimes people inherit Bibles and I guess because I'm the preacher in the family, I've inherited a lot of the Bibles. And so my dad had, I don't know how many Bibles I keep finding them, you know, there, there's a bunch of Bibles that he had. He was a pastor and he accumulated a lot of Bibles. And I have my mother's Bible and then I have both of my grandmother's Bibles. One of my grandmothers um, had a King James version of the Bible. Any of you have a King James version of the Bible, um, which maybe you grew up on? My, my grandmother used to say, if it was good enough for Je Jesus, it should be good enough for us. The King James version, you know? That, that's, the, that's what Jesus spoke and so that's what we ought to use. Um, not sure if that was ex entirely right, but, um, but I, I liked her sentiment. And, um, you know, the Bible is, is a, a difficult book. And first of all, it's 66 books. 66. It's like when we give those third graders Bibles, we have given them a library. You know, 66 books. Each one different and unique and all of them in some way or another with the purpose of telling us about this God who loves us. And that's the whole purpose of the Bible is to convey the story of salvation, the story of God's love for us. It's hard to understand sometimes. It's a complex book. I don't think it's simple, you know, at all. I don't think it's easy to understand. I think it's very important to understand the context in which it was written and what it's trying to say, what it was trying to say to people in its original setting, and then what we might overhear for our setting today, what that might mean for us today. And Christians won't always agree about everything we read in terms of the Bible, but it's pointing us to this story of God's love, God's love for us. Do you understand how much God loves us? And let's be clear, because we're studying the letter of James, that the love that God has for you is not because of the work you do. The love that God has for you is not because of something you've done to show God that you're worthy. None of us passed that test. Thank you for trying. But you can't do enough to, to make God love you. 
God just loves you. I remember being in seminary and, and listening to our professor who was, was a retired bishop, Bishop McFerrin Stowe, as he talked about God's prevenient grace, God's love and grace that precedes our conscious awareness. And we were, we were trying to understand, and he, he gave us this long theological answer, and I think all of our eyes glazed over, and, and somebody said, but what does that mean? And he said, I'll tell you a story. He said, when, when my wife Twyla and I were, were newly married, we, we'd been married a little while, we discovered that we were going to have our first child. And we were so excited, and we, we made a nursery, and we, we, we got, get, got, got ready, we had showers, and we had all this celebration, and we could not wait to receive our first child into our house. And in the ninth month of the pregnancy, something went wrong and they went to the hospital and Twyla delivered a stillborn child. And their hearts were broken. And Max said several days later, Bishop Stowe said several days later that he was, he was consoling his wife and and that she said something that he'd always remembered. She said, Mac, my arms literally ache to hold that child. And Bishop Stowe looked at us and said, now do you understand God's grace? That God's arms ache to hold you that God loves you that much. An amazing understanding of, of this God, not because of what we've done through our works, but this God who loves us. And that's the first thing I want you to, to get today is before you even start talking about what saves us, faith or, or good works, that you really have to understand we're talking about a God whose arms ache to hold you in relationship, that God loves you that much before you've done anything, that God loves you and you are a child of God. We say that every time a child is baptized or a person at, at any age is baptized in this church family, we, we say this, this water is the outward and visible symbol of something that's already true that this person is a child of God, loved by God, claimed by God. And that God loves us all like that. God's love knows no boundaries. God loves us that much. And if you've ever experienced, I hope and pray you've experienced that, that kind of unconditional, just love. That the fact that God loves you. And if you've never, ever before considered that, I want you to consider it today. You are loved by God. Your life, your life created by a God who loves you, who delights in you for you, just as you are, just because you're you, it makes God smile. Now, if you've never before gotten that, I, I want you to consider it. If you have understood that, maybe at some point, maybe today, you're understanding how much God loves you, doesn't it give a joy in your heart? I mean, doesn't it, give, doesn't it bring something in your heart that just, that just warms your heart? And it's probably not something you think about every day, but maybe we should. Just to, to begin the day and just to say, you know, I am a child of God. I'm loved by, loved by God. It brings a joy in your heart. One of our members sent me this wonderful video of her great-grandchild this week, Marilyn Evans. And, and Marilyn sent this great video of her great-grandchild who does not know she's being filmed 
But I found this to be contagious. I watched this over and over again this week because it was just the purest, most beautiful expression of the joy of knowing that you're loved by God. So let's watch five-year-old Madison playing in her room, unaware that her mother is filming her. Amen to that. Amen to that. Got the love of Jesus in my heart. I love it. She's got it. She understands something at this age that's so very important. That God loves her. And I hope you know that today. That you're loved by God. Now what do we do in response to that love? What do we do in response to that love? Here's a two-parter for you. First of all, we have faith. We believe. We trust in God. We say yes to a God who's already said yes to us. We respond by placing our lives in God's hands. We may still have questions. We may not understand everything completely. Some people think, well, I can't do that until I understand everything completely. Well, good luck. <laughs> it's a complex world. We don't understand everything completely. What we do understand is that this, this Bible tells us this truth about who we are, that we're loved by God. And in response to that good news, we, we have faith, we trust. We place our lives in God's hands. Paul Tillich said it this way, that you are accepted and that, that having faith is accepting the fact that you are accepted even though you may feel unacceptable. You know? Accepting the fact that God accepts you even when you feel unacceptable. Believing. Trusting. I guess the bottom line for me is just that I'd say it this way, God's got you no matter what. God's got you. And God's not going to let you go. It's trusting that. That God has you in God's hands. And that in life and in death and in life beyond death, God is with us. We're not alone. Thanks be to God. So we have faith. And, and, and our salvation comes through faith, through God's grace. We, we, we say that we believe. And there's salvation and power in that. That we are set free. But there's more, isn't there? I mean, you can't read the, the, the Gospels without understanding that Jesus is talking about putting faith into action. It's the way that we treat one another. It's loving God, not just God only, but also loving our neighbor as we love ourselves. And so James, uh, written by, attributed to the brother of Jesus, uh, writes these words that we were studying this week from, from James chapter two. And he says this, what does it matter if you have faith, but you don't do anything with it? What does it matter if you have faith and you don't put that faith into action? So he says it this way, faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. Someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works 
and I by my works will show you my faith. Faith without works is dead. So the works themselves that we do, the good deeds that we do, they don't save us. We're saved through faith in Christ, through God's grace. But it's out of the joy of what we've experienced, out of the joy of knowing that you're a child of God, that you want to serve and you want to put your faith into action. When I was in high school, I had this wonderful math teacher, Mr. Owens, and I had him for two years. Um, that's not because I had to repeat that class, by the way. I, I said that at the earlier service. That didn't come out the right way I intended. Um, I had him for two different, two different classes in high school. I had him my freshman year, and I had him my junior year, and he was a tough, exacting math teacher. And I remember that it was about that time, I think my junior year, that someone gave us a gift uh, our, to our family of one of those wonderful TI calculators. God bless all of our TI folks. We have so many, we have, this, this church was, I mean, this city was built on TI, this, this church, was, you know, a lot, we have a lot of former TI and TI folks, and some of them worked on that calculator. I thank them through the years. Thank you for making that calculator. <laughs> So a guy like me, math wasn't exactly my specialty. My goodness, what a gift that was. So I remember coming home uh, late from a basketball game um, about you know, 10 o'clock, 10.30 one night, and I had all this math homework the next day. And, um, and so I had that TI calculator and I thought, this is so cool. And I just, man, I just went through that, that homework like nobody's business. And I turned in all the answers and I knew I had it all right. And I got back my paper from Mr. Owens, and I had a failing grade. And I said, Mr. Owens, I don't understand. I got every answer right. And he said, Mr. Oliphant, what have I told you time and time and time again? Show your, show your work. You might get it right, but I want to know that you understand the process by which you got it right. Show your work. Show your work. So I had to do it all over again and show my work. You know, I think that's what James is trying to point us to as he, as he writes about faith without works is dead. You're not saved by doing these good works. You do these good works in response to what God has done for you. The, the good works that we do are, are our way of, it's the fruit of that joy we have in our hearts. We know that we're, we're loved, that we're children of God. And so as, as beloved children of God, out of the joy of our hearts, out of what God has done for us through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, we put our faith into action. We show what God has done for us by the way that we treat others, by the way that we care about others. And I think that's what James is getting at here. You know, too many of us as Christians, I think this is what he's, what he's trying to get at, too many of us as Christians, we say all the right things. We say that we believe in, in God. We say that we believe in Jesus. But we don't act in such a way that our actions are consistent with that belief. And I think James is challenging the church in his day, just as we're challenged by his words in the church in our day, to be consistent, to live our faith. That faith is not something that is, is just something we say. Faith is something that we do in response to what God has done for us. We put our faith into action. We show our work. As there is time and opportunity, we are called to, to live our faith, put our faith into action. There's nothing more beautiful. I, I have to tell you, as a pastor, it, it's one of the most amazing things of pastoring is to watch people who actually practice what you preach. 
I got to tell you, that's, a, that's, that's an incredible thing. People who inspire me by their actions. You know, we have a group of people from our church who are in jail today, not because they did anything wrong, because they went there to minister to people who are in jail. We have a group of people doing relief work on the coast because they've been so loved by God, they have the talents and gifts they want to go share and help other people. We have a group of people that go down every Sunday afternoon downtown, feed homeless men and women because they want those homeless men and women to know we don't just believe in Jesus. We believe in Jesus so much so that we want you to know we, God loves you too and we want to serve you this meal as a sign of God's love for you. I mean, there's so many ways that I see people living their faith. And I have to tell you, it's so inspiring. Because what good is it if you, if you say you're a Christian and then treat other people like a jerk? That doesn't do anybody any good. That doesn't help anyone. And it certainly doesn't help the brand name of Christian. Now, we're called to live our faith. We're called to, to, to not only understand that we are loved, but that God wants us to be loving, to care about our neighbor, to care about the least of these. As, as James says, to care about the, the widows and orphans, the most vulnerable people. How do we bless the most vulnerable among us? How do we reach out and show our care? Show your work, Mr. Owens told me. Show your work. There's something about that that is so inspiring. When you see God's love in action, it's contagious. When you see people who live their faith, and it's not something they, they put on. It's just something they do. It's just who they are. It's, it's faith that is alive and vital. And it's contagious. I love the way that, that uh, the words attributed to John Wesley, who said, do all the good you can by all the means you can and all the ways you can, in all the places you can, to all the people you can, at all the times you can, as long as ever you can, or something like that. <laughs> I just know it just keeps on going. As long as you ever can, you do good simply because God has loved you and blessed you. You're a child of God and you are loved and there's, you know, there's a choice you have. How do you respond to that? And Christians are called to say, I respond by saying, yes, I believe. And then by saying, here I am, Lord, Send me, let me go serve your people out of the joy of my heart. I have to tell you, it makes you happy. So very happy to have the love of Jesus in your heart. So very happy, so very happy to have the love of Jesus in your heart. So much so, it makes you want to give it away through your actions. Let's pray. <clears throat> Gracious God, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for the opportunity you've given us to be your people, to respond to you with our lives. And not only just to, to say that we believe in you, Lord, but your challenge is to do something, to be the Christians you've called us to be, to show we are Christians by our love, by the way that we care for the least of these. I thank you, Lord, for this letter of James. I thank you for the challenge that it, it is for me and for, for all of us. And I pray that if there's someone here this morning who has never realized how much you love them, that deep in the places of their heart you would he would just remind them that they are yours. And I pray that that joy would overflow from their lives as they serve you by serving others.
pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There's someone here today who would unite with our church family by your profession of faith in Christ as your Savior or transferring your membership to our church from, a, from another church. We would love to have you as a part of our church family. Two ways to do that this morning. One is to be received here during the, the closing hymn. We'd invite you to come to the chancel rail and be received here. The other way is to go to our joining room right after worship. The joining room is right down the north hallway, and one of our staff members will be there right after worship today to uh, receive you and welcome you into the life of our church. Let's stand as you are able as we sing our hymn. this congregation. Someone said to me after the early service, you didn't mention football today and it cost me money. <laughs> Are y'all betting on me saying something about football? I, mean, I didn't even mention the Cowboys play at noon. I saw some of y'all that usually come at 11 that are here early and, and I didn't mention that SMU's 3-0 and for the first time. And so I, I was good today. I didn't mention it. But if I'm, y'all shouldn't be betting on what I say up here. Isn't that wrong? I don't know. It's just, anyway, thank you for being here. Thank you for being the church. Thank you for being a place where people can come and learn about God's love. But thank you for being a church that puts faith into action. God has blessed us in order that we might be a blessing. Living the faith, putting faith in action is what we do. It's who we are. We live our faith by caring for our neighbor. Let's go into the world and be a blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.